Prime Time Crimes presents this crime education documentary featuring two real-life crime stories and I recommend watching as if you are the victim in each story. You will be able to identify the warning signs that led up to the incident. Then consider what you would do to prevent this from happening to you or to someone in your family and leave me a comment. If we can learn from these videos, we will be educated instead of just entertained and we can move from being paranoid to being prepared. Thank you in advance for subscribing, liking and sharing this video. November 28, 2014. It's just before 8 a.m. on Black Friday in a suburb of Fort Worth, Texas, when all hell breaks loose at the River Ranch apartment complex. Fire Department, what's the address of your emergency? Yeah, hi, I'm going to live over at uh, River Ranch Apartments. I think there's a fire upstairs in the apartment above me. Stay, stay with me, I'll get someone in the house. Another neighbor, 25-year-old Jeff Kaiser, notices the smoke outside and immediately runs upstairs to check on his friend, 31-year-old Ashley Harris. Ashley lived in an apartment complex with a lot of friends nearby, and he was really worried she might be inside. Jeff doesn't wait for the fire department. He got with a maintenance man and kicked in the door. And both went into the apartment. When they did kick in the door, Ashley's dog ran out. They were looking for Ashley, calling her name. She wasn't answering. The two men couldn't really get to the bedroom. It was too smoky and dangerous, so they exited the apartment. By that time, the firefighters had uh, arrived on the scene, and they went in with the equipment. As the smoke clears, it appears firefighters are too late. Firefighters immediately discovered a body. So they called the fourth police right away. Firefighters quickly realized the death wasn't the result of the blaze. They find a young woman bound, hands and feet on the floor of her bedroom, bludgeoned, stabbed, blood everywhere. It was immediately apparent this is not just a fire. We actually have a crime scene. I was the on-call detective for our unit for the Thanksgiving weekend. Upon entering the apartment, my immediate attention was in the living room. Nothing really appeared to be ransacked or uh, disturbed as, you know, indication of a struggle. I then walked into the bedroom where I immediately saw the victim laying on the floor. Her wallet was there at the scene with her ID that they could tell looked like this person, Ashley Harris. News of the fire spreads quickly throughout Fort Worth. Our friend called me and said that Ashley's apartment was on fire. I said, what? What do you mean Ashley's apartment's on fire? A crowd is gathering in the parking lot. Concerned family and friends are desperate for information. They were wanting to know, is that Ashley? Is that Ashley? We will often withhold that identification for the medical examiner to confirm that identity, either with dental records or with uh, DNA. I said, can you tell me anything? He said, I'll ask you a question. He said, does Jeremiah 29 11 mean anything to you? And I just fell down. I mean, my knees just gave out. I said, it's Ashley's tattoo. It's like someone like pulled the rug out from underneath you, you know? And, um, and then we knew. I put myself in their position, and that was the best thing I could do to let the friends and family, to let them know something. Born in 1983, Ashley Harris came from a loving, blended family. She was a Texas girl, uh, born and raised. Her parents divorced. Ashley Harris's father. He was a Fort Worth police officer at one time. He was friends with my father. Ashley's vivacious spirit drew everyone in. Ashley struck me as one of those larger-than-life personalities. She had a huge circle of friends. She was the really cute, fun, outgoing person. And so a lot of people were attracted to her, regardless of whether or not they were a boy or a girl. In her early 20s, an unexpected romantic spark changed Ashley's life forever. When she met Laura, she was she was straight. You know, she was pursuing men. And Laura just kind of took her by surprise. And they really just became very, very close very, very quickly. 
and then they moved in together. In 2004, Ashley was ready to share this revelation about her identity with her loved ones. When she did finally come out, you know, everyone welcomed that decision. The LGBTQ community welcomed Ashley and she thrived, like really, really thrived. While her relationship with Laura brought Ashley new friends and self-exploration, it wasn't meant to last. There was a pretty big age difference. Laura had a full-time job and Laura had her own place and Ashley was just still trying to find her way but they never stopped being friends. As a young adult, Ashley struggled to decide on a career path. When she was mid-20s is when she got into retail and then ultimately ended up at American Eagle that she really, 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 really loved. Ashley worked her way up the ranks, making assistant manager by the fall of 2011. She works at Hewlett Mall her manager loved her. The store employees loved her overall. She was great at her job. People said that she looked out for her staff, kind of helpful mentoring them. What Ashley loved about retail is that she got to meet new people every single day. She finally found like her place in life. Just as 31-year-old Ashley is coming into her own, her future is cut short. We have a 31-year-old female who has been murdered. Everyone spoke very highly of Ashley. She was this great person. For us, that's important. It's like, who would want to hurt her? It was horrific. It's very rare we see a case where a person is found in their own house. And of course, there was fire that was set to the house. Her bedroom was the point of origin for the fire, it appeared. The bed was partially burned, and her body appeared to have been burned partially. There was some type of trauma to her body. Uh, you could see signs of blood, um, see some bruising. This is not going to be your typical fire investigation. And arson investigators noticed something peculiar. The accelerant that we saw was a bottle of alcohol, rubbing alcohol. That's not a very flammable liquid. If you're going to set something on fire, the normal household alcohol doesn't really burn as fast and is not a very good accelerant at all. For that reason, the fire seemed like an afterthought to me. Coming up, detectives have their work cut out for them. The impression that I got was, no, this was not a stranger. Who would want to hurt Ashley? Could a surprise witness hold the answer? She was one of the last persons to see her alive. Friday, November 28, 2014. Homicide investigators in Fort Worth, Texas, are combing through the scorched apartment of 31-year-old Ashley Harris. She had been bound with duct tape. There was uh, trauma to the head and face area. The body was partially burned. There was evidence of a pretty violent struggle. Beyond the bedroom, investigators find a home eerily undisturbed. There's still money in her wallet, and her credit cards are still there. And so that was odd to them that if maybe it's a home invasion or a robbery, you would expect to see TVs taken, electronics taken, and they didn't see that. One of the neighbors and a friend had come over and tried to get in, make entry into the apartment. Jeff said that he ended up kicking the door in and our victim's dog ran out. He described the door as being locked, which that was interesting to us. How was the door locked? We don't know how they access Ashley's apartment. We just feel like by deducing all of that, there's no lock picking evidence. The impression that I got was no, this was not a stranger. And investigators are faced with another mystery. We knew that Ashley had a pickup that was parked at the scene. It was a white Dodge pickup. So for us, that was important because we wanted to search that vehicle. The problem is, detectives can't find Ashley's keys. The keys are missing, but it doesn't look like anything else is missing. It didn't look like a robbery. Once we realized, hey, the keys aren't even here, well, whoever did this could have easily used the keys and locked the deadbolt. 
Investigators continue to process the scene while another team searches for witnesses. Our job as detectives is to speak to anyone that's close to Ashley, whether it's family, friends, co-workers, neighbors, anyone that could possibly have a issue with Ashley. So when we were on the scene, I had interviewed Alexis Torres, who was a friend of Ashley's, and she was one of the last persons to see her alive. Friends tell detectives that Ashley had been working around the clock, getting ready for Black Friday. Ashley was going to work that Thanksgiving, and her friends had a little party because they wanted to make sure that Ashley was fed prior to having to go work. Alexis had to come over to take care of Ashley's dog while Ashley was working. She actually had to work late that night and then had to be at work early the next morning. Alexis Torres came over on three occasions that night, the last being uh, shortly after 3 a.m. And when she arrived, Ashley was already home. It was like 3 in the morning when Ashley got home from work. And the plan was Ashley was going to take a nap, take a couple hours, get back up early, 7, 8 in the morning, and go back into American Eagle. Ashley, Ashley wanted Alexis to to stay the night and Alexis couldn't because she had her father's pickup and she had to return it to him because he had to work the next morning. Alexis tells police that she hung out with Ashley for about an hour and a half before heading home. According to Alexis, she left about 4.40 or maybe 4.45 in the morning. Alexis remembered when she left and she told Ashley goodbye, Ashley locked the door behind Alexis. She remembers hearing that noise. Alexis also offers up another key piece of information. Ashley usually left her keys on this counter. She always keeps her truck keys with her store keys, and it looks like those are missing. Ashley's body is transported to the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office for an autopsy. Meanwhile, the crowd outside Ashley's apartment complex is growing. There was a lot of friends and family. Ashley was very loved. They all started gathering. Co-workers from American Eagle started showing up. As investigators talk to potential witnesses, one of Ashley's neighbors comes forward and reports that around 7 that morning, he saw something suspicious. Stephen Lee had lived at that apartment complex for several years, so he was very familiar with the people that live nearby. He turns out to be a retired uh, law enforcement officer from California, so he was very observant. Stephen Lee had a pretty structured routine. Each morning he would uh, step out, smoke a cigarette, and take note of who was home and who wasn't by where their cars were. Stephen Lee noticed a specific vehicle that he'd never seen before. He described that vehicle to be a two-door black Infiniti, which he thought was a G35. It was not a car that he was familiar with. He'd lived there for a while, and he, he knew his neighbor's vehicles. Everyone in that apartment has kind of assigned parking spots. It's not technically a sign, but everybody has their spot they park in. And so he noticed that car. More importantly, Steve says the black sedan had been parked next to Ashley's truck. The crowd was asked about an infinity that may have been visiting Ashley. Ashley's boss, Chris Cravey, is also standing by. Chris Cravey is actually one of the managers at the time. He was also very close to Ashley. They were friends. And so he immediately went to her apartment when he was hearing all about this. And when he hears that a Infiniti G35 had been at the scene, he immediately thinks, I know an employee that drives that type of Infiniti. Chris tells police the name of the employee is 25-year-old Carter Cervantes. Carter Cervantes had been working with American Eagle Outfitters for quite some time. The first time I met Carter, she was the store manager in Amarillo, Texas. She actually interviewed me for a sales associate job. She was the one that you wanted to like you because if you got on her bad side, there was no coming back from it. She would always find a way at work to make it harder on you. While Carter was managing the Amarillo store, she also hired 19-year-old David Mallory. Sometime during their working together, Carter and David became involved in a relationship. David was a stock manager. They weren't supposed to be dating because she controlled his pay, she controlled how much he worked, and she would just give him more preferential treatment. And our district manager basically gave her the option to quit or to get transferred. David 
David is 19, very young. Carter is 24, or 25, older. The managers discovered they had a relationship that was against the rules. Carter and her manager worked out they were going to transfer her to Fort Worth. She moved about six hours away to Fort Worth. David was still on our schedule in Amarillo. He didn't show up for three shifts in a row, which meant that he was fired and now considered unrehirable. So we made sure to put him in our system so that it would show that he was not allowed to work at an American Eagle anymore. However, Carter knew how to cheat the system and didn't let that stop her from hiring David in Fort Worth. She and David moved in together. Carter got him employed by changing his social security number. So in the system, it looked like this was a new employee with a different social security number. So that do not hire um, note didn't come up with corporate HR. While talking to detectives, Ashley's boss reveals another crucial detail. In August of 2014, months prior to the murder in November, there had been an individual that had gone into American Eagle and stolen over $18,000. Co-workers tell detectives that Ashley was the one who discovered the theft. A thin individual, possibly a male, comes in, goes straight to the safe, unlocks the safe, and takes money from the safe and walks out. The back door was left unlocked, which is how he got in. You have to have a key to open it. It's not a digital safe. It was obviously somebody who had worked at an American Eagle because they didn't search around. It was clear to Ashley that this is David Mallory that's entering in and taking the money. The person that would have left the door open would have been his girlfriend at the time, Carter Cervantes. So we believe when it was time to close up, she gave him the key for the safe. Hours after discovering the brutalized body of 31-year-old Ashley Harris, the assistant manager at a popular retail store, investigators in Fort Worth, Texas, get their first big lead. So back in 2014, in August, there was this robbery that occurred inside of American Eagle. It was the tax-free weekend. An individual had stolen over $18,000. After reviewing the surveillance footage, Ashley identified one of her co-workers as the perpetrator, David Mallory. The record showed that the alarm was not tripped, but the door was ajar. Carter Cervantes, as one of the assistant managers, would be one of the only people that would have a key to both the safe and to the back door. Earlier that night, Carter Cervantes had gone out to take out trash, which is not typically something that she normally does. But on this specific night, she did take out trash and she left the door propped open, and that's where this individual later that night made entry. When detectives pull the police report on the theft, they find that it's still an active case. From the police department's perspective, it was still an open case. From American Eagle's perspective, they were satisfied that they knew who had done it. Carter Cervantes was terminated after that and David Mallory never showed up to work, so he was obviously also terminated. Carter did hold this against Ashley because Ashley was the one that turned them in. Detectives become even more suspicious when they receive the results of Ashley's autopsy. Ashley Harris had a tremendous amount of injuries on her body. She had basically more injuries than anyone I've ever seen. She had a deep cut to one side of her neck numerous injuries on her face and head from being struck with a hard object. She had what we believe to be a stomp mark on one of her lower legs. There was evidence of ligature where uh, something had been wrapped around her neck and pulled tight uh, to uh, result in strangulation as well. This was somebody who killed her out of anger. This was torture. This looked like somebody who was mad at her. The cause of death is listed as asphyxia and blunt force trauma to the head and neck. She was deceased shortly before the fire started. It becomes clear to authorities that this was a rage killing and that Alexis Torres is not their suspect. Alexis was very cooperative and she was cleared pretty quickly. Alexis turned out not to be the best person to look at at that time after we developed two additional suspects. 
Investigators at the scene immediately start tracking down Carter Cervantes and David Mallory. We found through our research that they live in an apartment complex near Fulin Mall and near the crime scene and uh, that they did have a uh, G35, the exact kind of vehicle, seen parked next to Ashley's truck registered to Carter Cervantes. I contacted one of our undercover units to maintain constant surveillance on this apartment roughly from about three till about midnight. There was a white Cadillac that was parked nearby registered to David Mallory with the black two-door infinity it wasn't in the parking lot at that time. In the early morning hours of Saturday, November 29th, Detective Cedillo returns to run surveillance on the apartment. It's been nearly 24 hours since Ashley was found murdered. Upon driving near the building, I now see the black two-door infinity back then. So approximately 7.45 and the sun's starting to come up. I see the lights on the vehicle blink on and off as if someone has unlocked the vehicle, which gets my attention. David Mallory and Curtis Vaughn just both came outside. They got into her car and he followed them as they left the parking lot. He follows them just a couple of miles to Hewlin Mall, which is very interesting. Where are they going to Hewlin Mall early in the morning? The detective watches as Carter Cervantes exits the vehicle and enters the mall. She was wearing dark clothing. Why would they be coming back to a location where they used to work and where Ashley Harris used to work? It's 7.45 in the morning. The only people that are in the mall are mall walkers or employees. Detective Cedillo calls for backup before following Carter into the mall. When I went into the mall, as I'm walking, I run into Chris Cravey, who is standing outside of American Eagle with the gates still closed. I say, hey, by chance, did you see Carter Cervantes walk by? Chris says he hasn't seen Cervantes, but is anxious to get inside the store to collect a large sum of money in the safe from Black Friday. I asked him, well, what are you doing still standing out here? And he says, well, we changed the locks to the gate after we learned of Ashley's death. So he was waiting on his bosses to show up with the keys so they can go in. At that point, no one other than law enforcement knew that there was any keys missing. The locks were changed at American Eagle for precautionary reasons. On tax-free weekend and Black Friday, those were our highest deposit days. Sometimes two or three deposits would be left inside of the safe until they could take it. Carter would always joke that if I were ever going to steal a deposit, it would be Black Friday or tax-free weekend. And we always thought, oh, haha, ha, that's funny. Black Friday and special events are huge. Stores can bring in 50, 60, sometimes almost even 70K in cash. Carter knew the process, the timing, who did what when, how they made deposits. She knew there would be a lot of money in there. So for me, in my mind, I'm thinking that David and Carter are there to rob the money from Thursday night and Friday night. Outside, officers confront 19-year-old David Mallory, who appears to be waiting on Carter to exit the mall. He didn't want to talk. That's whenever we arrested him for not having his driver's license on his person. Our goal was to talk to David and also to get that vehicle. The search for forensic evidence. We took the car, but we don't have a right to search the vehicle legally until we obtain a search warrant. Meanwhile, Detective Cedillo is having no luck locating Carter inside the mall. At this point, the mall's starting to open up and customers are starting to come in. Now it's going to be even more impossible to locate Carter. So I decided to go and maintain surveillance at her apartment a couple miles from the mall. Shortly after the undercover officer spotted Carter Cervantes in the business office of the complex, the officers mentioned that she was wearing pink scrubs, which, you know, that didn't make any sense to me because when I saw her go in, I never saw her wearing any pink. She agreed to come down to her office to be interviewed. She volunteered of her own volition, went down, and so now the detectives have both of them to at least start getting information. I know you have a lot of questions about what's going on and why you're here. You're under arrest for uh, not having a driver's license on your person at the, at the uh, office here in Texas. When they asked David Mallory about why he was at the mall that morning, he told them that he brought Carter to the mall and that she was supposed to be doing some uh, new employee paperwork and that he was waiting for her to finish. And the reason why you're lying to her, you know she hasn't worked since she got the very I thought maybe I got it confused or something, but I'm not getting to say that without stuttering. November 29th, 
2014. It's been a little over 24 hours since the brutal murder of 31-year-old Ashley Harris. Now, investigators in Fort Worth are gearing up to interview their prime suspect, Ashley's former co-worker, Carter Cervantes. Carter Cervantes is super nice and friendly at the police department, uh, and looking them in the eye, answering questions. All right. Um, so how did you end up in Fort Worth? Um, I had a job opportunity with American Eagle Outfitters. I was a store manager for them in Amarillo, and they transferred me down here um, to work at Hewlett Mall. Okay. Are you still there? No, I'm not. And why did you leave that company? They decided to let me go um, on September 1st. There was a robbery at Hewlett Mall, um, and I had closed the night before. They determined that I had left the store unsecured, so they let me go. So where are you currently working? I'm not currently working. I do some volunteer work sometimes at Texas Health Heritage. So and do you own any other scrubs besides these? Um, yes, I do. We asked where she had been the last two days. She mentions that she cooked Thanksgiving dinner uh, for her and, and David, and they had a quiet dinner there at the apartment where they watched movies. After just half an hour, detectives decide to take a break and regroup. Thank you. We gave Carter a bottle of water, and Detective Pate and I step out, and we're sitting in our office, but we're watching the interview room through a monitor. She got a tissue, and she wiped the mouth of the bottle off. And she wiped the bottle down, and she used the tissue to put the cap back on. She never touched the bottle again. So at that point, I'm thinking, she thinks we're going to try to grab DNA from the bottle, which, you know, is only making her look more suspicious. So... If you're perfectly innocent, why are you wiping down a water bottle at the police station? When detectives ask Carter about her trip to the mall that morning, she denies it. You were not in that car this morning and you don't get out of the mall? No, I got up, I went and put the laundry in, and I went and checked my email. That's all. Okay. I know that's a lie. No, it's, no, it's not. You're about to make the biggest mistake of your life, you understand me? haven't done anything. She continues to deny that she ever went to the mall that morning. We thought she'd be the weakest link. Boy, were we wrong. She was actually the tougher one to interview. After the interviews, Carter is free to leave. But David is booked on the misdemeanor and sent to jail. David was arrested, but then it's just like getting a uh, no seatbelt ticket or a moving violation ticket. You get out pretty quickly. So he was out. They didn't have enough to charge them yet, but the investigators were narrowing in quite quickly. After the interviews, I obtained a search warrant for Carter and David's apartment. Initially, we weren't sure exactly what we were looking for, but we found some receipts. She was using credit cards, which turned out to be a bad mistake for her. We began to do follow-up investigation at those locations. We obtained some video. What they see on the surveillance video is shocking. On November the 21st, Carter Cervantes went and purchased a pair of short-handled shovels. And she purchased uh, what I'm going to describe as a murder kit. She had rope. She had uh, gloves. She purchased a tarp and uh, duct tape. When authorities pull the surveillance footage from the mall on Saturday, November 29th, the day after Ashley's murder, they see a familiar figure. It's Carter Cervantes. We have her going into the mall around 8 in the morning that next day after the murder. She's walking through the mall. She is wearing a gray sweater, the black pants, the black hat. Carter actually goes up to the roll-down door, and she tries to unlock the bottom of that door. That's when we knew she had Ashley's keys but she was unable to gain entry into the store. American Eagle, out of abundance of caution, had changed the locks at the store. The second that they got word that there had been an employee that was killed, corporate immediately changed the locks in this Fort Worth store. She did not bank on that. Later, when she walks from the mall towards her house, she is wearing pink scrubs. So our theory is that she has the pink scrubs underneath the dark clothing. And once the offense was committed, I think she was going to shed those clothes and now be wearing pink scrubs. Investigators' suspicions are finally validated. At that point, it's where it all becomes apparent that 
This is the reason why they killed Ashley Harris. They were there to get the keys. Following the November 29, 2014 interviews with murder suspects Carter Cervantes and David Mallory, investigators in Fort Worth, Texas, are inching toward justice for Ashley Harris, and the evidence is mounting. Upon searching Carter's vehicle, there was a uh, loaded Glock underneath the driver's seat. We located uh, several knives that were in the vehicle, and we seized two cell phones which belonged to Carter and David. When we open the trunk of David Mallory's car, those two shovels, the exact same shovels that she bought, were sitting in the back of his trunk. They had bungee cords and zip ties and a tarp, and to me, all that's indications of trying to wrap up a body somehow. But, you know, they weren't able to do that. The nail in the proverbial coffin comes with the DNA results. Carter's vehicle, the floor mat in that vehicle, would, uh, we ended up getting forensic evidence off of that. We found blood on the floor mat that had been transferred from David's boot to the uh, floor mat of the car. Sure enough, did match Ashley Harris's DNA. So that was a big, big piece of evidence that we were able to get. In addition, we got Ashley's DNA on this gun that was found in, in Carter Cervantes' car under the seat. Ashley had a star-shaped injury behind one ear that's purely the result of impact, and she had another one on the bridge of her nose. Eventually, we determined that the most likely thing that caused that was being pistol whipped. The arrest warrants for a capital murder were obtained on December 4th. David was arrested in West Texas. Once Carter learned that there was an arrest warrant for her, she tried to turn herself in with her attorney. Her lawyer was adamant that we couldn't speak to her and was upset that she was getting arrested. David, however, agrees to answer some questions. David, uh, are you aware what you're under arrest for? The charges are... He did admit that Carter stole the tax-free weekend money back in August, but wouldn't admit to the murder. Man, I don't know nothing about no homicide, but I don't. I really feel like I'm just getting drugged into this because she doesn't want to go down the road. When detectives pull the couple's phone records, they find a blueprint for Ashley's murder. Once we were able to forensically analyze those phones, the entire case and their plan was was spelled out. The planning and the prep for this horrible, horrific event is just kind of part of their daily life almost in their text messages, like back and forth. What's for lunch? What's for dinner? Let's go to a movie. Oh, yeah, I got the duct tape and the shovels. It was evident to us that Carter was the mastermind behind this, and I think David was the muscle. She's the one that coordinated everything and came up with the plan. On Friday, November 28, 2014, authorities believe Carter and David laid in wait outside Ashley's apartment until she returned home from her retail shift. To this day, we still don't know whether or not the door was locked and how the suspects actually got in. She fought for her life. Duct tapes, hand and foot, stabbed, bludgeoned, uh, asphyxiated. The fire was uh, set to try to cover up other evidence. We believe that Carter Cervantes Locked the door on the way out. I mean, if they had her keys. And if they want the place to burn, it makes more sense to lock the door behind you. She was motivated by greed. She wanted money. She was motivated by revenge, uh, hatred. And finally, though, she was motivated by the thrill of it. She loved doing this. And that's not all. I kept going through the phone records. And I found they had text messaged each other GPS coordinates. This coordinates flew out into the middle of nowhere, north of Abilene. David Mallory sent this text, these coordinates to Carter on November the 25th, four days after she purchased these shovels. What they find at that spot is chilling. They walk directly to the spot where these coordinates uh, directed them. And they found what can only be described as a grave. We believe that David used those shovels to dig that grave, and the intent was to have transported Ashley's body there and buried her, and that the plan just didn't work out. 
They put a lot of planning into this. I don't think they expected that Ashley was going to put up a fight. Their plan fell apart very quickly, and they, they got desperate. My opinion is it was harder to move a dead body than they thought it was. And for that reason, they tried to destroy the crime scene and destroy evidence with the fire. Carter Cervantes fancied herself, I presume, a criminal mastermind. But in reality, she was an amateur, and she was uh, she left a trail of evidence a mile wide. On May 26, 2016, Carter is convicted of capital murder and receives a mandatory sentence of life without parole. Ultimately, the jury in David's 2017 trial holds him just as responsible as Carter. Both Carter and David are doing life in prison without the possibility of parole. They will both die in prison. It takes a really evil person to be able to commit a crime that elaborate. It's unfathomable. As swift as the life without parole was given on both defendants, we'll never be able to give her back to the family. All of us that experienced it will never be the same person that we were before November 28th, ever. The mark Ashley left on this earth and the happiness and joy that she brought everyone, myself included, never leaves. I think that there's a piece of her that's with me sometimes. August 23rd, 2005. Deputy Robert Blythe with the Richland County, Illinois Sheriff's Department is on patrol. Richland County is a county in southeastern Illinois. We have several small communities in the county. It's mainly farming. It's a very compact, friendly community. Everybody knows everybody. It's just after 3 a.m. on an otherwise quiet night when a call from dispatch comes across Deputy Blythe's radio. I was actually preparing to go home, end of shift. I got the call from my dispatcher. She said there was a lot of screaming on the line. The dispatcher was only able to discern a few alarming details. What she gathered was that someone had been shot, someone had been stabbed. Deputy Blythe rushes to the home in Claremont, where he finds a chaotic scene. When I got there, there was a pregnant woman that screamed at me that somebody had been shot and somebody had been stabbed, and they were in the house. I did not know the lady. At that point, my focus was get in the house and see what's going on. Blythe approaches the home, and once inside, the full scope of the violence comes sharply into focus. When I got in the door, the first thing I saw was a man that had been injured laying on the floor on his back trying to scoot himself towards the door. Then, Deputy Blythe spots a familiar face in the room, 23-year-old Jackie Jackson. I've known him for a long time. He knew me, of course, and he just yelled out my name and said, Robbie, I've shot him. Before he gets the full story from Jackie, Blythe immediately ensures paramedics are en route. My first impression was from the amount of blood that I did not see how that person was going to survive. Nearby, there is another male victim, bleeding profusely, but also still alive. They observed someone laying on the kitchen floor that was bleeding from the chest and abdomen. I saw the knife that we assumed had been used in this laying on the floor beside the one victim. The horrific scene continues to unfold in the utility room, where the deputy finds a third victim, a woman clinging to life. She had numerous stab wounds to the stomach area. You walk in and you got so many people laying around crying out of pain. While waiting for EMTs to arrive, Blythe asks Jackie what happened. Jackie explains that the man he shot is an intruder, and the two stabbing victims are mother and son. He is able to identify two of the victims, Jacqueline Bennett and Joshua Bennett. As for the intruder, all Jackie can say is that he was the one who stabbed the others. We didn't have a clue who he was or why he was there. 
medics arrive. Both Jacqueline and the attacker are still alive, but by then, 20-year-old Joshua has lost too much blood. Joshua Bennett had been stabbed one time, real deep wounded, the chest area, which uh, he succumbed to those wounds. As paramedics work to stabilize Jacqueline and the attacker, detectives arrive. When I went to the scene, I was informed that the officers had secured the residence and made sure that the first aid was being applied to those that needed, and the coroner had been contacted for the deceased. There's very few murders in this area where you walk in and you got so many people that are injured and trying to figure out who's the bad guys and uh, who's the good guys, because nothing can be taken for granted or it may cost someone else their life. Joshua Bennett was born in 1985 in the small town of Mattoon, Illinois. After his parents, Jacqueline and Jerry, divorced in the early 90s, Josh spent most of his childhood with his father. After they got divorced, Josh wanted to stay with his dad, where he had a little more stability. Josh and his mom grew farther apart as time went on. He lived with Jerry here in Mattoon and went to school. They were two single guys living together in an apartment, doing what two single guys wanted to do. In 2004, after graduating from high school, Josh knew exactly what his next step would be. When Josh was in high school and joined the ROTC, we already knew then what his future was going to be. We had no doubt that when he graduated high school that he was going to be going into the service. I believe Josh just wanted to kind of get out of the Mattoon area and travel and just see, see the world. Everybody was rooting for him. You know, we were all proud of him. In July 2005, 20-year-old Josh was stationed in Louisiana. Joshua had just finished basic training of uh, six weeks and he was uh, getting ready to go overseas to Iraq. Just before Josh was deployed, he received devastating news. His father suddenly passed away. When Jerry passed away, Josh was in the field. There was no means of communication. So Josh didn't get to hear it from loved ones that his dad had passed away. By the next day, Josh was on leave and back in his hometown of Mattoon. Of course, it was difficult for Josh, and he was devastated. Him and his father were really close. While he was back in town, Josh's friends encouraged the grieving soldier to reconnect with his mother, Jacqueline. But Josh was reluctant. To be honest, he didn't want to go. But his father's death gave Josh a new perspective and a change of heart. The loss of his father made him think maybe he needed to reconnect and try to work on that relationship with his mother. We had went to his mom's a couple times before for like cookouts and stuff like that. That day in particular, I decided not to go. And I had talked to Josh on the phone when they were getting ready to eat dinner and I was under the impression I would talk to him tomorrow. I never thought that that would be the last time that I spoke to him. Within hours of the call, Josh Bennett is lying dead on the floor of his mother's home from a single fatal stab wound. Jacqueline and an unidentified assailant are being loaded into separate ambulances for transport to a local hospital. Still at the scene, Jackie and Lindsay are physically unscathed Although it's clear, Lindsay is in distress. Police tried to interview Lindsay, but she was hysterical at the time. And uh, in her condition, they decided it wasn't an issue to be pushed. Jackie, however, is eager to talk. He explains that on August 22nd, Josh came to stay with his mother, who lives with her boyfriend, Lee, Jackie's father. Jackie and his pregnant girlfriend, Lindsay, were also living there at the time. Jackie was just beside himself, almost in a panic. He offered up a lot of information there in a short period of time. Jackie reveals that while he managed to shoot one of the attackers with a single-load shotgun, the second man was stabbed in the leg during the fight, sending him fleeing. The intruder that got away had been wearing a mask, so Jackie wasn't able to describe what he looked like. 
With one suspect on the loose and another on his way to the hospital, investigators have a lot of ground to cover. Knowing that the severe gunshot wound to the abdomen could end the assailant's life, Sergeant Kelly Henby follows the ambulance, hoping to secure information before it's too late. A brutal stabbing in Mattoon, Illinois, leaves 20-year-old Joshua Bennett dead and his mother Jacqueline clinging to life. A sheriff's deputy waits at a local ER with the hope of interviewing one of the intruders who stabbed them. The suspect that had been shot, nobody had any idea who he was. With a massive manhunt underway for a second suspect, investigators back at the crime scene continue their interview with 23-year-old witness Jackie Jackson. Jackie says that he and his pregnant girlfriend, Lindsay Kaysinger, were asleep when just after 3 a.m. he was awakened. He was down in the basement. And he heard a commotion and heard Joshua Bent calling for help. Jackie explains that he woke Lindsay and told her to run to the neighbor's house. He loaded the 12-gauge shotgun and ran up the stairs. He saw two men in black clothing and ski masks and stabbing Mr. Bennett in the chest and abdomen. He moved in and struck the one individual with the butt of the shotgun and knocked him away from Mr. Bennett. And the second man grabbed the barrel of the gun and as he pulled it, gun toward him, uh, Mr. Jackson pulled the trigger, hitting the suspect in the stomach. After Jackie dropped the gun in a panic, the second assailant attacked with a knife. The other person had made a move towards him, and he had grabbed a knife and stabbed the suspect's right leg. the second assailant ran off. As the chaos unfolded, Lindsay summoned help from a neighbor's home. Lindsay, fearing for her own life and for the life of her unborn child, manages somehow to get out of the house and she runs to a neighbor's house to ask for help. And that's when 911 is called. To investigators, the seemingly random and vicious attack is unlike anything they've seen before. Catching the second suspect becomes their top priority. The individuals who charged the man have notified the residents to their local radio station, you know, locked their doors that there's an armed suspect in the area, and canines were brought in. I was concerned mostly about where's the other guy. We were just in search mode. We were trying to find that other suspect. As the manhunt continues, at nearby Richland Memorial Hospital, with physician's permission, authorities speak with the injured suspect. Because of the severity of his injuries, we knew that he wasn't going anywhere. He was technically under arrest, so we had police there at the hospital guarding him. I knew right then that if he didn't survive, these statements he would make to me would be very important. So I went over and removed the oxygen mask from his face. He was in pretty bad shape. He was pretty weak, but he was able to tell them that his name was David Lindner. As far as his accomplice goes, 29-year-old David can only give a first name, Ricky. Sergeant Henby continues to press David for information. I asked him why this happened, what's going on, and he said the lady put a hex on us, so we had to kill her. I said, who put a hex on you? He said, the lady did that lives there. She put a hex on us. That's very unusual. Since I've worked so many death investigations and murder cases, I'd never had anyone come up with witchcraft or hex. When I first heard that witchcraft was alleged in this crime, I was actually in a state of disbelief. The thought of it being involved in uh, this community is shocking, to say the least. While the interview raises a lot of questions, it does yield important clues. Police knew they were looking for someone named Ricky, and they knew that they were looking for someone with a stab wound in their leg. They were able to put out an APB to be on the lookout at all local hospitals and the surrounding area. Eager to ask Jacqueline Bennett about David's bizarre hex claims, 
Investigators find her in serious but stable condition. When they inform her of Josh's death, she is devastated. When she shares her version of the attack, it's all too clear her son Josh died trying to save her. She woke up and went into the kitchen. She was approached by two intruders who just started stabbing her. Jacqueline Bennett received three substantial knife wounds to the abdomen. When Joshua hears his mother in distress, he charges up to come to her protection. Josh managed to come in between his mother and the attackers, but he paid the price when he was fatally stabbed once in the chest. He heard his mother need help, and he went. No questions. He was a hero. Detectives ask Jacqueline if she has ever met David Lindner. She didn't know who this person was either. She is just as puzzled when detectives ask her if she has any knowledge of a hex or witchcraft in connection to the case. Upon being given the news from the investigators about this hex, Jacqueline actually had no clue what they were talking about. She said that her boyfriend, Lee Jackson, was at work. He was there all night and that early morning when the attack occurred, so he was never looked at as a suspect. Just hours after the brutal scene unfolded at the rural Illinois home, investigators have few answers. They arrive back at the station to research possible leads. While there, they learn their APBs at area hospitals might pay off. Sometime after 8 a.m. that morning, police received a call from the Lawrence County Memorial Hospital letting them know that they'd have a patient with a stab wound. He wouldn't tell the hospital how he received the stab wound. The hospital says the man's name is Oscar Eck. As advised by my dispatch to go to the Lawrence County Hospital and that I was to interview him. Sergeant John Waggle arrives and is surprised to see a man limping out of the hospital. When asked for ID, the man complies. He is 38-year-old Oscar R. Eck. R for Richard. He said, everybody called him Ricky. Sergeant Waggle asks why he's there, and Oscar explains he wanted some fresh air, but plans to go back inside to get treatment for his leg injury. He raised up his right pant leg, and there was a fresh blood-soaked wound with blood running down onto his sock on that right leg. It appeared to be a stab wound. I asked him how he had received that. He explained those injuries away as being drywall work-related. I knew what Oscar was telling me was not the truth. Just hours after 20-year-old soldier Joshua Bennett dies defending his mother, Police believe they've found one of the suspects, Oscar Eck. But they are soon joined by Oscar's friends. While Oscar was being questioned by police in the parking lot, two women walked up, Jenny Wolf and Irania Cotner. The two had apparently been waiting to pick up Oscar Eck, and their behavior immediately gets the attention of investigators, especially Irenia's. Irina was very, very nervous. To me, she was visibly shaking, eyes downcast. Oscar re-enters the hospital under police watch and receives treatment for his leg wound. Investigators ask 34-year-old Irenia and 20-year-old Jenny to come to the station for questioning. They agree. Irina Cotner asked no questions why the police were there, what was going on, which, to me, a normal person would ask those questions. Neither Jenny nor Irenia claim to know anything about the murder, although Irenia's behavior continues to raise red flags. When I entered the interview room, I saw a very disheveled young woman. She had her head down, very nervous, and would not cooperate. She was just stonewalling. With nothing more than a hunch, investigators have no choice but to let Irenia and Jenny go. With Oscar still at the hospital, detectives run a background check. While no prior offenses come up, 
they obtain Oscar's last known address and pay a visit. A woman identified herself as Oscar X roommate, Misty Gangla. She allowed officers to come in. Investigators ask 23-year-old Misty if she knows anything about the bloodshed that took place earlier that day. She told them that she didn't know what was going on with Oscar or why they were there. But as Misty talks, investigators spot something unusual. They did notice that there was a book about witchcraft. It actually took the investigators back to what David had told them at the hospital in regards to a hex. Upon seeing witchcraft literature in the residence, it would confirm suspicions I had that this was witchcraft related. Police ask Misty to come to the station. Once there, she readily admits that she knows both Jenny and Irenia. Misty had been friends with Irenia and, and Jenny for at least four years. They were employed by the same retail outlet store. The three had become fast friends after discovering they had a lot in common, including a shared fascination with the occult. Their involvement or interest in witchcraft at the beginning was pretty light. Uh, some good luck charms, some, you know, cleansing their house with sage. They would have these candlelit ceremonies and they would talk about ridding themselves of hexes. Misty says Irenia made herself the leader of their little coven. Irenia was just kind of known for getting involved with people that were younger than her. It seemed like she went for people that could be easily manipulated. Irenia was particularly close to Jenny Wolf, a woman 14 years younger than her. Irenia Kotner unofficially adopted Jenny Wolf to remove her from a bad home situation, and the two of them lived together. Jenny looked up to her as a mother figure and would have followed her off a cliff. She was Jenny's hero. But after a couple of years of innocent seances, Misty says their ceremonies took on a more ominous tone. Misty said sometime in spring of 2005, Irenia first started just constantly complaining about a hex that had been put on her. Part of the reason she began to believe Irenia when she said that a hex had been placed on them was the fact that a number of um, Irenia's dogs began to die as if someone was poisoning them. Misty recalls how other dark omens started to befall Irenia's coven. Another way that Irenia Cotner convinces Misty that a hex has been placed on her is by drawing a connection between the hex and uh, the bouts of depression and migraine headaches uh, that Misty has suffered from. While there was no proof the ailments were caused by a hex, Irenia was very convincing. Irenia Cotner just had a very controlling personality, and the group was somewhat passive. Irenia told Misty that the hex had been placed on them by a woman Irenia claimed was a witch, Lindsay Kissinger, who police know as the pregnant woman from the crime scene. Misty shares another detail that connects Lindsay and Irenia, Jackie Jackson, the father of Lindsay's unborn child. In 2000, Irenia met Jackie Jackson, and they fell head over heels and were in a passionate relationship for the next four years until it ended in November 2004. Irenia was understandably heartbroken and devastated. When Irenia met Jackie Jackson, she was actually 10 years his senior. So he was in his early 20s and she was in her early 30s. Misty says that when Jackie broke up with Irenia to be with a younger woman, Irenia couldn't handle it. Irenia knew that Jackie was with Lindsay and they were going to have a baby. That may have very well been the moment when she snapped. Irenia also brought Misty's roommate Oscar into the group. She soon convinced him that Lindsay had also hexed him. Irenia Kotner, as the 
head figure of this cult had exercised her authority over the group and she was basically the leader of the group. They all shared a common interest in the occult. That's what drew them all together. She was an influential woman in the respect that she could convince all these people that Lindsay Kaysinger had placed a hex on them. Misty claims Irenia told them there was only one solution to free the coven of Lindsay's dark influence. Irenia Cotner tells the other people involved with this that they have to kill Lindsay and her unborn child. From that point on, Misty says she had nothing to do with Oscar, Jenny, or Irenia. While Misty's story answers many of investigators' questions, it does leave one unanswered. If all of this was about Irenia's beef with Lindsay, then why would Lindsay be the one to walk away unharmed in this case? And why would Jacqueline and Joshua be the victims in this attack? On August 23rd, 2005, Illinois investigators interrogate 38-year-old Oscar Ricky Eck, one of two suspected killers in the murder of 20-year-old soldier Joshua Bennett. Oscar is very willing to talk and answer any questions asked of him. Oscar admits that as crazy as it sounds, Irenia also made him believe Lindsay had hexed him. He said she was able to convince them that not only they were in danger by the hex, but their, their loved ones, their family and friends were in danger. And the only way to break the hex would be to kill Lindsay and her unborn baby. It seems Irenia had a strange hold over the younger, lost souls she surrounded herself with. The people involved in this, they needed a place to belong. I believe that they were all followers, and Irenia was the person that was the leader. And she set down the rules, and this is what we do, and she made all the decisions. When Misty bowed out, Oscar says he agreed to work with Irenia and Jenny to kill Lindsay. They go to Lindsay's house with a gun and a knife, but Jenny can't get even to the front door because she's she's too scared. Irenia decided they needed to bring in another person for backup, so Oscar offered to reach out to an associate from the occult community named David Lindner. David had just newly arrived in Albany, Illinois, and he proclaims himself to be a warlock. Irenia Kotner decides to involve Cameron in this uh, murder plot. She was looking for people that she could rely upon to commit the crime uh, that she wanted to commit. David became a gun for hire. On the night of August 22nd, Irenia conferred with David and Oscar. Oscar and David went to Irenia's house, and they, the three of them had one final seance. They would ask yes or no questions, and she told them that she could interpret the flickering of the flame as a yes or no answer. After a few minutes, Irenia announced that the message was clear. During this seance, the candle told Irenia that tonight was the night. That was the night that they had to go and kill Lindsay. According to Oscar, Irenia presented them with a carefully laid out plan. They were to stab Lindsay and her unborn child in a ritual sacrifice. And the plan had to be carried out within a finite window of time. Irenia also told them that if they didn't complete the task by the time that candle burnt out, that their entire family would be at jeopardy and die. While Irenia herself would not go with them, she assured them they wouldn't be alone. Irenia told them that they would be accompanied by five sub-demons to help protect them and make sure that nothing went wrong with the plan. It gave David and Oscar the courage that they needed. Oscar tells investigators that Irenia's hold on them was so strong, he and David quickly jumped into action. This was so tight grip. They were just, you know, amateurs. But they were dangerous. Just after 3 a.m., they arrived at the home where Lindsay was living with Irenia's ex, Jackie Jackson. 
We were told later that they actually crawled in through a kitchen window doors to be unlocked, especially in this small community. Oscar tells them that the plan went awry almost immediately. As I stood in the hallway, on the hall, and encountered Oscar Eck and David Linder. They stabbed Jacqueline, thinking she was Lindsay, because it was dark in there. Moments later, 20-year-old Josh appeared. Joshua Bennett came to his mother's aid, and he was subsequently stabbed and killed. The plan continued to go sideways when Jackie came upstairs, leaving David and Oscar wounded. Oscar was stabbed, and then he subsequently escaped the house and went back to uh, Irina's house. At the point that they decide to take Oscar to the hospital, they've really reached a point where everything has gone so wrong with this crime that now they don't quite know what to do. Following his stunning confession, Oscar is placed under arrest and charged with first-degree murder. Josh and his mother weren't the target. They had nothing to do with it. They were innocent bystanders. Later that same day, investigators secure warrants to bring Jenny and Irenia back in for questioning. It's clear that Jenny is struggling with her current predicament. Jenny Wolf never gave me any indication that there was an evil bone in her body. She was very polite. She was chatty. Jenny confirms Oscar and Misty's accounts and admits that while none of them besides Irenia knew Lindsay, Irenia was so persuasive she basically brainwashed them. Irenia was able to convince them that all of the bad things that happened to them in their life were not their fault. They were this one person's fault. And if they could just get rid of this one person, all of their problems would go away. Eager to hear Irenia's story, investigators confront her in the next interrogation room. Even at the point that the authorities have sufficient evidence to suspect Irenia Kottner is the mastermind of this crime, she continues to proclaim her innocence. That's when I went at it real hard, saying that we were very tired. Everybody knows that you're involved. Other people are cooperating, and I was being very firm with her. Irenia finally breaks. Within 10, 12 minutes, she confessed she actually wanted to kill the, the young lady that was pregnant. The interviews were enough to contact the state's attorney and uh, showing that they were a danger to the community. We placed the three women under arrest after the state's attorney okayed it, and they were put in custody. Coming up. As her once loyal followers turn on her, Irenia's true colors are fully exposed. She jazzed up this whole ex devil worship thing to try to get the rest of these people involved. She was jealous. Irenia threw a tantrum in the courtroom and told the judge to kiss her ass. Prosecutors in Richland County, Illinois, are preparing to hold 34-year-old Irenia Kotner responsible for masterminding the bloody attack that left 20-year-old soldier Josh Bennett dead and his mother Jacqueline severely wounded. Jacqueline survived her injuries and was released from the hospital two weeks after the incident. In February 2006, over six months after the murder, David Lindner, Irenia's co-conspirator, dies from the gunshot wounds he received during the attack. He never left the hospital. He went into a coma and, and succumbed to his injuries. Irenia's trial begins in October of 2006. In their opening statements, prosecutors allege Irenia's true desire to kill Lindsay had nothing to do with the hex. Irenia was upset because... Jackson had moved on to a new girlfriend, and Irenia was plotting on how to kill this girl to get Jackie Jackson back in her life. She jazzed up this whole hex devil worship thing to try to get the rest of these people involved. She was jealous. 
After finally seeing the writing on the wall, Misty, Jenny, and Oscar all take the stand against Irenia. When it came time for them to cooperate, they did, and even testified against her in court that she was the ringleader. She was the person responsible for this entire event. No one acted on their own. She told them what to do, when to do it, where to do it, and why to do it. Jenny Wolf and Misty Gangloff and Oscar Ack and David Linder wanted to believe that they mattered. And this little community they formed in their worship of the occult gave them that sense of belonging. On October 25th, 2006, the jury announces their decision. The jury returns a guilty verdict against Irina Kotner on three counts. Conspiracy of first degree murder, first degree attempted murder, and home invasion. After the guilty verdict was rendered, Irina Kotner threw a tantrum in the courtroom and told the judge to kiss her ass. That's why she said her last words to the judge as she left the courtroom. No remorse. At her sentencing hearing, Irenia receives 57 years in prison, what is essentially a life sentence. He told her that with her age and adding those 50 years, she would probably never get out. Um, she would probably die in prison. And I was kind of happy about that because she shouldn't be out. Irenia is a pure sociopath that should not ever be able to contact people. She should have been in a padded room years ago and maybe Josh would still be alive. In 2006, Misty Gangloff accepted a plea deal for conspiracy of first degree murder. In 2007, Oscar Eck pleads guilty to first degree murder and receives a 20 year sentence. Jenny takes a gamble and goes to trial. In 2008, she is found guilty of murder and sentenced to 32 years. My personal opinion is on some of the sentencings, they were a little bit light because people lost their life here. Any one of those individuals could have stopped this at any time, but nobody stepped forward. As for those who loved Josh Bennett, his loss is a wound that endures. God tells me I have to forgive him, and I have forgiven him for what they did, but I'll never forget. They lost that they put in my heart. I'll never forget. The two tragic incidents in this video highlight the fact that you are more likely to meet your demise by someone you know. By watching my videos on prime time crimes, we can learn to recognize the warning signs leading up to the incident in each video and take the necessary action to remove ourselves from dangerous people or potentially dangerous situations. Thank you for subscribing, liking, and sharing this video and for your continued support of my channel.